Welcome to the Industrial IoT Spotlight, your number one spot for insight from industrial IoT thought leaders who are transforming businesses today with your host, Eric Walenza. Welcome back to the Industrial IoT Spotlight Podcast. I'm your host, Eric Walenza, CEO of IoT One the consultancy that helps companies create value from data to accelerate growth. And our guest today is Tony Nicolaitis, Chief Commercial Officer of Origin AI. Origin AI uses Wi-Fi sensing combined with AI analytics to enable companies to track presence, motion, and specific events like falls by using existing Wi-Fi signals. In this talk, we discussed how Wi-Fi signal sensing can eliminate the need for specialized sensors in use cases such as security systems and fall detection. We also explored the business model possibilities for telco providers when Wi-Fi signals become a data source in themselves. If you find these conversations valuable, please leave us a comment and a five-star review. And if you'd like to share your company's story or recommend a speaker, you can email us at team at iot1.com. Finally, if you have a research strategy or innovation initiative that you'd like to discuss, please email me directly at erik.walenza at iot1.com. Thank you. Tony, welcome on the podcast today. Thank you very much, Eric. It's great to be here. Yeah, no, and I'm really looking forward to this conversation. When I first saw your colleague reach out to me, I thought, okay, Wi-Fi? Is this, you know, we're covering IoT? Is this something interesting? Like, I, I don't really want to have a podcast on how to hook Wi-Fi up in a house. And then I looked into it and I thought, this is super interesting. So Really looking forward to understanding, you know, what you're doing, what it's used for, and, and also how you do it to some extent. But before we get into that, Tony, share a little bit about your background. I think you've got um, also quite an interesting background, something like uh, 20, 25 odd years, Black & Decker, actually. So really working on the industry before you got into this tech company. Eric, thank you very much. And again, great to be here. Yeah, I've had um, been around a little bit through the hardware industry, but now I've gotten into SaaS. I mean, I spent a long time at the over 20 years at Black & Decker, a great company, and did a lot of hardware development there for the first 20, well, it was actually 26 years. The first 20 years, I did a, a lot of hardware development and product. And then in the last six years there, we started to develop SaaS types of products. And we did a lot of initiatives in terms of getting into the technical aspect of construction. And that's where I began to really love higher tech value propositions and product solutions. I mean, after leaving Stanley Black & Decker, I was the uh, chief revenue officer in another small company that uh, called on contractors again, especially residential contractors. And then now I've got the great opportunity and uh, the honor of being the uh, chief commercial officer at Origin, where my responsibilities are basically anything related to customers, revenue, partnerships, and that kind of thing. Gotcha. And what was it that drew you to Origin? I mean, you've had a you know, very successful corporate career. I guess there's a thousand problems that you could be throwing your energy at. What was it about this company, this problem that attracted you? Yeah. So Origin was, it was an interesting thing. In the end, a good friend of mine that I worked with for a long time at uh, Stanley Black & Decker, we were talking on the phone and he said, hey, I'm a part of the startup. And and he and I had actually, when we were at Black & Decker, had looked at this startup from a technological partnership standpoint, but he ended up going from Stanley Black & Decker to Origin. Long story short, you fast forward a few years and he said, hey, you ought to come over here and take a look at this. And um, he's the CEO now, Spencer Maid, and went over and uh, it was 10 minutes of talking to him, seeing the technology in the demo house. And I said, wow, I've got to be a part of this. So Spence called me and in the end, uh, we ended up partnering up together again. He's a CEO and, and I support him as chief commercial officer. Cool. Okay. Well, let's get into it. I mean, most people, when they hear Wi-Fi, they're going to think, okay, I can connect my device. And then some people might be thinking, okay, maybe I can triangulate a device, for example, that's you know, getting a, a signal from multiple routers. Right. But you guys are doing something else. Can you, you know, share what is the problem here? What's the, you know, what's the landscape? Yeah, so Origin does something very interesting. It was a technology that was 10 years in development before we started actually commercializing. It was a technology that was developed by Dr. Ray Liu, a University of Maryland professor. 
And Dr. Ray Liu is now our chief technology officer and chairman of our board, still very, very heavily involved in Origin. Dr. Ray Liu is a world-renowned digital signal processing engineer, the outgoing president of IEEE. If you know anything about digital signal processing, Dr. Ray Liu will be most definitely in the conversation. You know, Dr. Ray Liu figured out that Wi-Fi and Wi-Fi disruption, the Wi-Fi waves disruption that happened in a house, for example, or a building. Wi-Fi is out there. It's like a water wave, you know, and as you move and I move and my hands move and I breathe and walk around, those Wi-Fi waves are disrupted. And so imagine Origin being a technology on top of your ubiquitous Wi-Fi that you have in your house. And we look at those disruptions in the Wi-Fi signal and not just look at them, but we can give you extreme detailed context about that disruption in terms of you're walking or a person has sleeping or a person has fallen or that kind of thing. So, and we know if a person should be there, shouldn't be there. And so it's really a technology that's built on top of your regular Wi-Fi that uh, gives you tremendous and clear and definitive context about what's going on in that house or in that building. Yeah, I mean, that's when I saw that, I thought that's incredible because I can imagine an empty room and the Wi-Fi can say, okay, this room is stable. Nothing's going on. It's empty. And then I can imagine somebody's in the room, a cat, a person, whatever, and it's moving. And you can say, okay, there's a disruption. But that's like an A, B is, is there a disruption or not? That's kind of the presence topic. But then you're talking also about, can you tell if somebody falls? So the specific action of, you know, a mass kind of moving down suddenly, or even is somebody breathing? I mean, that is such a subtle action, right? And so, I mean, help us understand a little bit, what does this look like? Is it kind of one Wi-Fi router? Are they kind of set up around the room? Or what does that actual setup look like in order to sense? Yeah, excellent question. That's what we call the topology. And there are a variety of different topologies that we can execute depending on the use cases. So we have uh, multiple customers that are out there and uh, we're downloaded on a router. Let's say that we've partnered with a customer, for example, one of our biggest customers and our, our first customer really was Verizon here in the US. And we're deployed on uh, Verizon routers across the US. Now, when that router has our technology embedded in it, basically that router pings all the other IoT devices that are on the Wi-Fi network. Imagine, you know, you can have Alexa, Google Home, Sonos, your TV, your smart appliances. The average US home has 17 smart devices in it, right? So we already have a topology that exists naturally in the house that consumers already own. And that router now creates a zone from itself to each of those IoT devices. And remember, Wi-Fi can go through walls. It can go across big structure as long as there's Wi-Fi there. And it creates these zones between the router and those devices. So there's many zones created to give you very clear coverage in the home or building and then at that point, if somebody is within that zone, that router is talking to that IoT device back and forth and back and forth and seeing the disruptions through our tech of that Wi-Fi signal between the router and that IoT device. And then from there, our AI goes to work and tells you what's going on. Got you. Okay. Okay. So it's not just your equipment, but it's your equipment communicating to all the other connected devices. And then I can imagine if it's like a presence use case, then a lot of different topographies could work, right? You just kind of know, yeah, there's something being disrupted. If it's maybe a breathing use case, then you might need a more precise topography, right? Because there's this subtle action that's happening in, in one you know, part of the room. So to what extent do you deploy where you say, we're just going to deploy the situation. We don't know what the topography looks like in this particular person's house, but we know it's going to work. and then. What are the use cases where you say, we're going to have to make some recommendations about them setting up a specific topography to make it work for a particular use case? Yeah. So the most prevalent topology is the router and you know all the IoT devices that are in there. And that will be able to do what we call macro motion, walking, jumping, running, moving our hands about, all the way to what we call micro motion and breathing. Okay. And that topography, again, as long as there's Wi-Fi and that router's connecting and pinging all these IoT devices, when you walk into a room and let's say you sit down and you're watching TV 
and all of a sudden you've fallen asleep, we won't lose you, right? We know you're there. We know there's a person there. That's the most prevalent topology. That's a topology that exists. That's the easiest topology because basically as long as you have a router from a Verizon, you're there. All the way to more complex topologies, like we're doing in the future in our health tech space, where let's say falls, for example, where you'll need other sensors besides the, uh, the IoT devices that will allow you to make sure that we catch the fall, you know, and even other topologies such as, um, you know, like a sleep insights that we're going to be working on that are going to be coming in the future. You'll need sensors on either side of a bed to be able to monitor your sleep. So it depends on the topology. It depends on the use case. But the prevalent topologies that we're going to market with right now and scaling are very simple topologies that can be executed that are not not going to weigh heavily on the customer in the house. So we're going to get to these more complicated topologies over time, but we're scaling on very simple topologies just to get, you know, we're, as we're getting the business off the ground. Gotcha. Well, let's walk through a few of those and give people a really concrete understanding of what you're doing today. So what are the two, three, four things that you're focused on today? Yeah, today we're focused on um, three areas, right? We're focused, uh, three verticals. We're focused on what we call uh, security, just like the home security, and being able to make sure that uh, we know if a person should be there or shouldn't be there. In the security industry today, the biggest issue that security companies have, ADT, you know, Simply Safe, Vivint, all these guys, and even in Europe, is false alarms. And when a consumer buys a security product and their phone is blowing up because of false alarms, they tend to turn everything off. They tend to churn customers a lot. So how are we going to solve this false alarm problem? We're going to solve it in two ways. And again, this is a topology that you can have a router with just the IoT devices in the house, right? Very simple topology where we'll be able to know that a uh, person is in there. Okay. So, you know, let's say that you leave and the security system is armed. We'll know partnering up with like a Verizon. Verizon knows the phones and the devices that should be in the house. They know that. So they know if somebody walks in and it is a phone that's not known and we know there's nobody in in the house and we know that the security system has been armed, we know that this is an intruder definitively. We know that it's an intruder, right? So that will absolutely trigger an alarm. Another big issue is pets. Pets walk around and set off alarms. We can distinguish human and non-human, right? So we'll know it's a human or it's a non-human, whether it's a pet or an oscillating fan or a rumba vac, whatever. So all those false alarms that are triggered, we will be able to solve those. And then another big issue with false alarms is disarming. You know, you get in the house, you have your groceries in your hand, you have all these things in your hand, you're trying to disarm the alarm, you don't get there in 30 seconds, the alarm goes off. Well, you're carrying your phone. The system knows, hey, it's Eric that walked in. I see his phone. I know it's Eric. It'll auto disarm. And then when auto, when you leave, it'll auto arm. So you have auto arm, auto disarm. You have pet filtering or non-human filtering. That will significantly eliminate the biggest issue that's happening in the security industry today globally in a massive industry. And that will make our technology very, very disruptive. So that's security, number one. Number two, we have what we call smart spaces or IoT. So for example, energy management, right? For the longest time, they are, have used infrared sensors and all over your office, right? And they will use those to make sure you're in your office or not in your office. And as you remember, sometimes you're sitting in your office and your t- lights turn off and you got to wave your arms to get your lights back on. You don't have to do that anymore. Our technology will know that there is a person definitively in there and that the light should be on and that the temperature should be set to a certain point, right? Same in your house. Today, you got to go through and set up these schedules by day, by night, by weekday, by weekend, no more. All it's going to do is say, I see Eric, he wants it at 70 degrees, it's going to stay at 70 degrees, right? So that's the other thing we call smart spaces, that's a use case. And then last but not least, internet service providers, right? Like the Verizons of the world, uh, that want to increase their value, broaden their value to their customers, right? So they're using our technology to offer other services using our technology. That's a broad kind of scope of what we do. And then we're going to be getting into health tech, like we said, fall detection and other things as we move into the future, into, into 2024 and 2025. 
Gotcha. Yeah, yeah. The health one is a bit fishier also because of the regulatory issues and and yeah. so forth, right? Um, it's more difficult use case. We've already started. We can do it. But as we're scaling, we're going from startup to scale up. We're going to get after these first initial verticals, really get in there, and health will come for sure. Yeah. For the security one, I can imagine that also working in a lot of B2B environments, but with somewhat, I mean, different environments, right? So it's not one family that has a set of mobile phones. Maybe it's a, it's a museum, it's a warehouse. So are you looking at those use cases or do you think right now it's better suited to the home where you have more of a controlled environment? Security, we're going to start in a residential in the home. And like I said, it's a massive, massive market. We're going to be launching with the first, uh, the largest European alarm company, number two in the world called Verisure. We're going to be launching with them here uh, coming up this year. And uh, we're going to be launching with another massive, great partner in alarm.com. So we're going to be really becoming prevalent in the security space. And uh, there's significant opportunity there that I think um, partnering up with the security companies in the space that we can uh, we can make and we can take that. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. I mean, focus also also is important. Talk to me a bit about how you work then. So you mentioned Verizon, you mentioned a couple partners here. So it sounds like your path to market is not by saying, here's our product, buy it to the consumer, but you're really, you're really collaborating with companies that have an existing solution in the market. What does that configuration tend to look like? Yeah, I mean, by configuration, you mean the business model? The business, exactly. So how yeah. do you, yeah. Yeah, so we are primarily B to B to C, right? So you know, we will partner with these companies that are in these verticals. And how we typically go to market is they buy our technology, they embed or put their, our technology into their router or into their whatever they have in the home. And then they go sell that to their marketplace and to their customers. Uh, we partner with them and, and sell along with them if they need, obviously. But um, from there, we, uh, you know, we will develop a business model or a Ref share model with those companies as we go along and get through the, um, the development process. So we partner with them, we develop with them, they launch, and then we share in the revenue that happens afterwards. Gotcha. Yeah, because it sounds just from the use cases you were explaining, it sounds like some of them, like a security one, might be really well defined from day one. Like we know what we're doing, we know the value, and we already know what we're charging people. We're charging them twenty five bucks a month, and you know, and you could say, okay, we're going to take $2 a month or whatever that might be off of the top. And some of them, like the one with ISPs, sound like there's, you know, maybe a lot of innovation that's going to happen. Like, you know, we know this is interesting. We don't know exactly how we're going to use it, but we'll roll it out and then we'll start kind of seeing what use cases we can enable around this. And so it makes sense. I guess you're going to, yeah, learn yeah. as you go and then establish business models that make sense. You got it. And some ISPs already have a very clear idea about what they, what they want to do. Some ISPs want to get into security. So we just apply the security use case to the ISP and they're off and running. We go. So we try to, Eric, we want to make sure when we have a customer playbook for every customer, what they're looking for, we have a very deep discovery process for every customer, as you would guess. And we try to really understand what their use cases are. With this technology, as they're, it's new to them, sometimes we've got to guide them and give them options. And we usually land in a use case that can go sell their customers, they can monetize, and then obviously we monetize too. Yeah, got it. Yeah, so, I mean, we didn't get too much, or I think we're not going to go too deep into the tech stack, but it sounds like the analysis here is pretty heavy lifting, right? Because, I mean, you're kind of doing like some kind of probabilistic analysis of, you know, waves and Wi-Fi from, you know, 17 different sources and, you know, and then determining did somebody, you know, did somebody fall and so forth. So it sounds like a, a pretty heavy analysis. Is that happening on the edge or is it being sent to the cloud and then kind of sent back with some kind of conclusion? What does that architecture usually look like? Yeah, we are the only company in our space that does everything on the edge. And we've been thoroughly tested by that. What do I mean by that? On the edge, obviously there's privacy elements there that are very good and uh, privacy advantages there. But also it does not affect the Wi-Fi bandwidth in the house or the building. What, what do I mean by that? You know, Verizon here in the US, we've also won the Deutsche Telekom business in Europe, right? Two massive telecoms on either side of the pond. And um, they thoroughly tested us to make sure that origin does not affect my bandwidth so that I can 
give my customer the maximum bandwidth they need to, to live their lives. And so being completely on the edge allows us to have that functionality. And it's been proven that we don't affect any of the bandwidth. And then, like I said, privacy and everything else that comes along with being on the edge. Uh, we do everything completely 100% on the edge. Okay. Yeah, that's an interesting point. I hadn't thought about that. But yeah, I guess if you had this solution and it just had to send all the data you were collecting to the cloud to process and send it back, then somebody would be you know, a bit frustrated with their streaming, right? And Yeah, we're taking up bandwidth to get it to the cloud back and forth, uh, however many times that happens. So it makes sense. Yeah. Exactly. yeah. Okay, great. And then communication to the customer. I mean, this is a bit of a new way of doing things. How do you tend to communicate? Do you kind of just take like a black box approach and say, hey, the, here's the new solution, it works? Or do you try to really actively communicate to the end customer, the consumer, about here's this new technology? I mean, do you put like an origin AI, you know, powered by origin AI yeah. in the box? Or do you try to kind of keep it under the hood and just say, hey, this is the magic that, uh, that makes this thing work? Yeah, so that's something we're always evolving with. Thus far, you know, when you have the muscle of a Verizon behind you and they get behind the product, you don't have to do very much. So they're very well known. It'll be the same with Deutsche Telekom in Europe. It'll be the same with any security company that we partner with, you know, Verisure in Europe. You know, so you don't need to do anything there. In terms of the powered by origin or origin inside kind of thing, we certainly would love to get to a place like that, you know, but as long as like we're on their website, as long as we have a joint formal announcement, we're partnered together that we can go leverage within our content, we're fine with that. And, uh, you know, we just let them market the way they market to their customers and kind of that's it. Yeah. Well, and it sounds like, I mean, it's working. You have a fantastic set of very large partners, right? So that's a, you know, <laughs> that's a luxury to have, right? I guess another path that you could take if, and maybe you would be taking if these partners hadn't come on board is to say, you know, work with startups who are trying to bring a new value proposition to market, a new product to market. Is that something that you would consider or are you really focused on saying we need to capture the top 10 players in the market and just focus our energies on these larger partners? It's all about focus. You know, you get those top 10 players in each vertical and you're going to be doing really well. And again, you know, resources in a startup are precious. So you don't want to go after the long tail because in the end, you're going to devote doing working with a customer in the long tail is just as hard as working with the top 10 customer. So it's obvious we're going to work with the top 10 customers in each of those verticals, and that'll get us where we need to be. And the, and the tail will come over time. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. Maybe sometimes even more challenging, right? Because they're also figuring out their businesses as you go. Exactly. You know, some of them are smaller and they, yeah, they, they take longer. Exactly. Maybe it's even a bigger lift for the long tail versus the top 10. Absolutely. Um, so in terms of the benefits that, let's say your partners, right? So the, the B in the middle of the, the B to B to C are receiving, do you see this primarily as we have a new value proposition to bring to the market or are there operational benefits in terms of some kind of, you know, cost savings or are they restructuring, you know, how they do delivery? I mean, I guess I could imagine, for example, an ISP that's now providing security can basically do a security system with no additional hardware. Right? It's like you already have all the hardware in the place. You don't need to. So you're kind of eliminating the whole bomb cost of any hardware sensors that a traditional security provider might need to have installed in the house. So that could be kind of like a restructuring and a big cost savings there. But what's your sense of how they're making a business case around the use of Origin AI? You just nailed it. You know, they will position themselves versus these other security companies and do exactly what you just said. You know, kind of dematerialize the whole thing. They make it as simple as possible and they position it in a way that makes it very easy and extremely advantageous for their customers to take it. And they have that in their messaging that they put in the marketplace. Gotcha. Okay. And like, for example, in security, false alarms and reduction of false alarms. In the security industry, they can absolutely market that because they know that's an issue with their customers. They know it's a cause of churn and they can say, you know what, they can market less false alarms. And all of a sudden, you know, consumers will realize that and then it's not just a, their customer benefit, it also reduces their churn. So it's an operational benefit. So it, it goes both ways, really. I mean, they, they maximize financially from the whole thing. Yeah, no, it makes sense. So there's a, 
yeah, value proposition side on the yeah the architecture of the hardware and and that impacts their cost structure. But then also there's a new kind of new value being provided to the customer uh, that wasn't you know, really wasn't possible. It wasn't possible without a lot of you know extra headache and uh, and hardware previously. Right. Let's talk a little bit about what you see in the future. So this is I'd say it's still a relatively young technology. You're now scaling up some of your larger partners. If you look out 12 months, 24 months, what is exciting for you right now in the business? Well, you know, when you look out 12 months and you look at our verticals is really partnering with these top companies in those verticals, seeing those top companies and their customers see the advantage of what Wi-Fi sensing can do and what Origin can do for them and then start penetrating other verticals deeper like health. And, you know, the thing we get excited about is positively impacting millions of people in their homes in a positive way and making their lives easier than it is today, you know, punching in a security code or having false alarms and you're in the office and your phone's blowing up because, oh, there's somebody in your house when it's really your cat moving from one room to another and health, you know, being able to, to take care of our elderly parents and they can still with dignity live at home. So I think we can significantly positively impact the lives of millions of people around the world in our and say, we're going to change the world. So I know it's very dramatic, but that's the, kind of what we say. We're going to change the world. We're going to make the world a better place. And that's really what we, we really believe it. All of us across yeah. the, the whole, the whole group. I mean, we need solutions like this. I mean, um, I'm sitting here in Shanghai in China, and um, you probably read the reports. China's got a big aging population. Oh, yeah. They don't have the luxury in the U.S. I think we're spending um, something like $10,000 per person per year on healthcare, right? And so they don't have the luxury to do that in China. That would be pretty much the entire GDP of the country. And so, you know, what do you do, right? And you need solutions that are allow people to live at home safely. Yep. And you need to do that cost effectively, right? And so certainly the world needs new solutions. If we look at the technology and how it's developing, is it a technology where you say it's basically, you know, you've gone through this 10 year uh, development cycle, it's basically ready to go today, it's mature today. And now the goal is to figure out the partnership structure and kind of figure out the use cases. Or do you think that every 12 months, there's going to be maybe significant advances in the algorithm, for example, or in, in other you know, ways that you process data, for example, that are going to open up kind of unlock doors. So is it more about kind of getting the commercial structure in place, or is it also about making these continuous technology advances to unlock new use cases? Yeah, I'll bring up the word focus again. You brought it up. I brought it up. We're focused on scaling now. We're ready to go. Technology is ready to go. As long as you have Wi-Fi in the, in the house, in the building, we can work over that Wi-Fi and do what we do. So we are ready to go and scale and work with our partners. Now, we have a very stout product road, Eric. And over time, I think we're going to get better and we're going to have new use cases that open up and those will come. But right now, Eric, we're focused on really driving the technology. It is mature enough to drive and it has matured and working with our partners across the globe. Great. Well, Tony, sounds like you're going to be busy, chief uh, commercial officer, right? So yeah, the weight is on your shoulders here then. Uh, usually the CTO is, uh, is the one kind of, you know, carrying a lot of the stress. But I think in this case, you know, I'm sure the company is looking at you to uh, pull it forward. And it sounds like you have a great product. So I'm sure you'll be very successful. Last question, Tony. What is the best way if somebody's listening and they're interested in learning more, what's the best way for them to reach out to your team? Go to our website, Origin Wireless AI, or search Wi-Fi Sensing, and you'll get to Origin AI. You'll get to our website. And you can uh, ask for a demo or ask any, any question or put any, all the information. We're going to get back with you very, very quickly. Awesome. Tony, thanks a lot for joining us on the podcast today. Eric, it was my pleasure. Appreciate you having me. Thanks for tuning in to another edition of the Industrial IoT Spotlight. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter at IoT1HQ and to check out our database of case studies on IoT1.com. If you have unique insight or a project deployment story to share, we'd love to feature you on a future edition. Write us at eric.walenza at iot1.com.